Welcome to the Small Business Evangelist Radio Show, the show that brings you candid interviews, case studies, and cross-industry insights to help you accelerate your own small business success. Here's your show host and small business evangelist, Jack Schoenberger. Welcome, everybody. In today's episode, we're going to have a conversation with Stephen Kuhn, who was a U.S. Army veteran from the Gulf War, decorated veteran from the Gulf War, and then took a European out and has an eclectic career, including a being a nightclub entrepreneur, bodyguard to the stars, and executive in the fitness industry in Europe, and now specializes in doing branding seminars and business turnaround workshops for companies not only in Europe but here in the United States. So I recently met uh, Stephen in the Vepreneur Tribe uh, Facebook group, uh, which is made up of U.S. Army veterans, or should I say military veterans, who are now turned entrepreneurs. And I was anxious to be able to get hold of Stephen and have a conversation with them. And uh, with that said, and with that introduction, let's go to the interview. All right, Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Awesome opportunity. Awesome opportunity. Glad to be here. Well, I was, I was taking a look. We, we met originally uh, online over at the Vepreneur Group on Facebook and then within the Warrior Council. And as I got to know you a little bit there, I became fascinated and, and, and finding out more about you and what you do and, and your background. But it, the more I looked, the more it became very evident that it's really kind of hard to put you in any type of of box. You've had a very eclectic life. Could you just tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, You're right. You you chose the right words, eclectic. I'm, you know, my whole life has been like that. So when I was growing up, we had, um, we moved every, every few years. And when I, of course, when I joined the military, what do you do? We'd move every few years. And then after that, uh, I got out and I moved every few years again. (laughs) So I've been moving every few years. The longest I've been somewhere now is in Budapest, which is where I now live for eight years, but I'm only there Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. I'm in the rest of Europe those other days uh, traveling, doing my business. It's hard to say what I've done, but all what I can say, one red line runs through it, and that's always striving to be better and to do better. And at the same time, um, balancing out my, let's say, spiritual soft side of things, because as you know, as a veteran, um, we have we tend to be harsh and hard sometimes, and that's difficult on civilians. And I learned early and quick and the hard way um, that in order to be respected, it has nothing to do with your with your tonality <laughs> or how loud or how strong you are. It has to do with the respect that you gain from the others, which we know from the military, but it's a different kind of uh, business, uh, say, soft skills that we use in the civilian world. And as much as that sounds like something come from an MBA, I learned it the hard way, which is why I did so many things. I just kept having to leave or move along or move on at times even uh, homeless um, uh, and had to restart again. So I kept restarting, restarting, restarting. And one thing that shined through to me was that uh, that military attitude, never give up. And I just refused to give up and refused to be negative. That's fantastic. From from your career, do you want to hit some of the highlights? I know currently you have S2K2 Precision Management Company and you're a principal in that. Yes. And- also, you do consulting from one of the things I read. I think you have one of the largest nonpartisan political organizations, too, that you help manage. Right. Exactly. Well, <clears throat> um, basically, I do I do NGOs uh, and I do my for profits, of course, my S2K2 precision management started out actually back in 2000 or 96, actually, but 2006, we started making real money. And that was, we did uh, film production uh, in the States and I did co-production here in, uh, in, in Europe. My twin brother um, is a mortgage banker and we leveraged our funds and started producing. And then we had the crash in 2008 and that killed everything. Um, but S2K2 lived on and it's now a consulting company. Um, I do uh, workshops and I do startups and turnarounds and I do coaching and keynote speech is speaking. Um, and, and I have to say it's all about leadership, conscious leadership, using your intuition in order to grow your business, choose the right business, choose the right products, choose the right people. And, um, and then I have on top of that, you end up consulting companies. They always have different needs. And because of my background, I have contacts all over the world where I can usually 
99 percent of the time fulfill those needs in one way or the other so it's it's a it's a very lucrative business i'm in because of the simple fact i have solutions for just about everything that happens or i know somebody who who, who knows knows the solution so you know i can't really say what i do exactly but i, I like to say turn around startup because just about every business needs help and uh, when businesses start up they usually don't know what they're doing in every in every division of, of their business so i help them there and then i do the online and retail sales of products from all over the world to all over the world, you know, Target, Walmart, or some of, some of my clients and, and, and things like that. And then, of course, the nonprofit political pressure group, let's say, it's a non-party political organization, the largest in Germany. Um, it's got more members than anyone else in Europe. It's uh, through this party. I'm one of the co-founders. There's three of us. Through this uh, foundation, we founded a party, and it's now the fastest growing party in the history of the new Germany. And they're gaining uh, parliament seats in the European Union and on the German Bundestag as well. Uh, this the election is is now. It's in it's in like in two weeks, uh, and uh, we'll see what happens. But yeah, I'm pretty busy. I, I work in the consulting side of the of the uh, of the political political arena where I talk about you know American German uh, relations. I talk, I'm the, I'm sort of an advisor to one of the party heads. For uh, they, they call me advisor, but that's just because they want to be nice. I usually they usually call me when they're stumped, um, and I help them with um, inner security and immigration issues as well when it comes to Europe, Eastern Europe. Since I live in Budapest, and I have connections to the Hungarian government as well. So you see, I can't really <laughs> can't really boil it down. Yeah, it's difficult. But one thing rings true, Jack, and I got to tell you. When and, and I heard you know um, I heard one of your other guests um, say it before, um, and. Uh, we're both very much the same, the same, uh, in the same jive when it comes to that. That's, uh, we, when, when Albert said it, it all comes down to people, everything we do, everywhere we go, everything we, we touch has to do with people. So for me, any business is possible because I can deal with people. You had mentioned before the balancing between the business side and the spiritual side, and the also you had have attributed your military background, uh, to the importance of learning, you know, solid structure, the right people, which is again a theme. And I think um, you had mentioned before about that balance between the spiritual side of the house. Could you tell me a little bit about how you developed that? From what I understand, you spent some time in a monastery actually after getting your MBA. I did indeed. <clears throat> I um, well, it all happened at once, sort of, uh, and uh, I ended up uh, being in a place where no one wants to be. Um, some veterans know about that. And I had to get out. I had to figure something out. So I called a friend in Austria and I said, uh, you know, get me out or it's over. And uh, within an hour, he sent me an e-ticket, got on a plane. He brought me to Austria, drove me to a monastery up in the mountains and said, get out. I'll pick you up whenever. And I just went there and I gave up everything. I had no laptop, no telephone, no nothing. Uh, and just disappeared into this monastery with 80 monks. Um, it was a Benedictine monastery. So it was quite interesting because it's Christian, but they also meditate and do yoga. <laughs> so it was quite interesting. Um, and the oldest monk had been there for 80 years. So the energy in that space was very big. So I walked in there with the typical, okay, let's find a solution. And I asked the monk, okay, what do I do? I have these problems. How do I solve it? And he said, go to the forest. <laughs> so I went to the forest and just waited. And it took about two weeks until I came down from my high perch and realized where I was and what I was doing to myself and to people around me. And through my daily sessions of meditation and praying and whatever you want to call it, I learned more about me. And it's funny how suddenly you're learning about yourself when you don't say anything, you don't ask any questions, you don't have you don't you don't have anyone to talk to because you stay silent most of the time. And it's just about reflection. So that really, really balanced me. I walked out of there. A long time later, I was like eight months, uh, maybe six months. I think I can't remember because after that, I went to the mountains and lived in like a wooden hut for a while. And I had people come up and feeding me. So they bring me water and bread and sometimes meat. Um, and I just looked up there and meditated for days on end like some guru. And, and uh, until it got too cold, and I went back to Berlin. So what that did is that gave me a basis in order to always fall back on when I feel doubt, when I feel maybe some weakness, which is rare. Uh, when, if, if anything, it's, it's doubt and depression that, that, come, that creeps up. You know, you get up in the morning and you just feel like I got to fight. I have to fight more just to even stand up or to even look at myself in the mirror. And there's no, not necessarily the specific reason for that. It just happens. So I, uh, I, I fall back and I 
gain the strength from what I what I grew back then, and I use it uh, in the present day, and it's incredible. So I keep that going uh, in in different ways. One of the ways is I continue to meditate when I can. Um, I don't see anything as pressure. I don't see anything as I have to do anything. I do it when I need it. And if I can do anything prophylactic or if I can do anything as, to pre- as prevention, I do that as well. I train every day. I'm 50 years old um, and I train every day. So I moved along and 10 years ago. I started working with ayahuasca, which is a med- medicinal plant from the Amazon. It's the mother plant or the, let's say the feminine energy plant from the Amazon. And that is that really enlightens the mind. It brings you off a focus like you've never seen before. It clears out all of the peripheral that's sort of distracting you and not letting you go where you want to go. And it makes it very, very clear with yourself who you are and where you want to go. So all suddenly all these things you're fighting for just fall away and it just happens. So that's what I mean by balance. I have to have both sides. If I'm only working, I'm very good at just only working. I think we all know what that means. Um, but then I'm missing the soft side. And the soft side is a spiritual side for me. It's because I have two small children and a wife, a young wife, um, I need to have that soft side so that they still have the feeling that I'm part of their life and not just some guy out there working and providing because that's how it can turn into. That's what it can turn into. Well, one of the things that I found when I, I'm going down to my own trying to, to become more spiritual myself and, and I, I find – what you're telling me very fascinating is that for me, the more I look and find out more about me, I also understand the larger whole, how we're all connected. And it gives me a better understanding of really everybody else. Is that what you find also? Oh, of course. Right. Well, the first thing that falls away is judgment. <laughs> you know, you, you learn not to judge and you, well, you, you realize it does absolutely nothing to anybody but you. Um, it just creates bad energy. And that's the first thing that falls away. And then when you, when the judgment falls away, empathy rises and you have empathy for people. You don't have the guy screaming at you at the mall or whatever. And you look at him and go, Jesus, I feel bad for this guy. You know, how can I help him? How can I get him away from that anger and move him closer to some pleasure? You know, <laughs> what can I do to talk to him? What's one word I can say to him or some kind of gesture I can give to him to make him feel this is unnecessary. It's only hurting you. So there, there are things that happen and, you know, through intuition. Um, so definitely. You know, connecting to people, like I said, our whole world is all about relationships. And in this day and age of dwindling personal interaction, let's put it that way, because of online, it's even more important and has much more of an impact when you take the time with somebody to be personal. So I, I, for me, it's it's the A&O, as they say, the, the number one and two of my uh, my business and my personal life. It's got to be there. And it's interesting that you bring out the interconnectedness and, and the online piece of it, because one of the, the themes that I see with you being so successful in, in these various uh, enterprises that you're doing is that you are providing really leadership to people. And, and I think a lot of people today are starved for leadership that does have empathy. And I think you use the term conscious leadership uh, whenever right. you talk about, you know, how you work with people and how you work with companies and, and how you lead them to success. Indeed, conscious leadership. Uh, it's it's uh, what I came up with, I don't know, probably 15 years ago. And what that means is being conscious of how I am. And I talk about three things, honesty, integrity and transparency, um, honesty to yourself, transparency to yourself and others. And of course, this builds integrity and this integrity dictates your market value. Because you are authentic and you are unique. And I do this with companies as well with people. And it's much easier than many, many may think. We usually stand in, in front of uh, in something and put our hand in front of our face and don't, don't understand why we don't see it. So it takes sometimes the smallest efforts and the smallest discussions, usually one or two coaching sessions. And there's a huge difference in the way that they, that, you know, the clients work with themselves. But in the end, you know, it's all about, again, we fall, we, we, we go back down to people again. So everything we do is intuitional. Um, when I talk about conscious leadership, it's intuitional. Um, it's, it's about being authentic. It's about being real. And real means when you need help, you ask for help. When you don't feel right, you ask, you say you don't feel right. Be transparent with yourself, meaning, well, you know, as a, as a veteran and, and I was in combat as well. So I know what it means to lie to yourself. You know, um, I didn't do this. I didn't do this or I had to do it. It was, I had no choice or whatever. And you, you do that to protect yourself. Cognitive dissonance, they say. Um, well, you got to get past that as a leader because you owe it to those around you, your team, to be everything you can be, to, to, to use the term, um, 
because in the end, you're not a leader unless you have a team, period. So what's the point? You know, and, and either you are nurturing and growing your team to be bigger and better than you are, or you're not a leader, in my opinion. Exactly. The, mm. And it's a discussion we often have inside the Warrior Council over over at the, the Vetrepreneur Group. The the other thing I'd, I'd like to, to ask you about is, is that you've, again, going back to your eclectic background, you have had some pretty cool jobs. Which would you, what, which ones do you think are the most, uh, the, the coolest to you or the most interesting ones that you've worked? Well, you know, I've actually, I've done a lot of crazy stuff. I think the coolest things I've done was, you know, being involved in one of the first techno clubs that opened in Berlin. It was illegal. It was underground. Uh, it was dark and dreary and Madonna showed up and Prince showed up and we were killing it. And it was just, it was that, it was one of those times in, in, in history where, you know, wow, that was, you know, we're part of history because techno music came from Berlin and, um, all these famous DJs now were all of our house DJs back then. So it was, that's quite cool. And then of course, you know, the typical things like Mick Jagger's bodyguard or, you know, <laughs> Pamela Anderson, things like that in Germany was fun. I've, I was very fortunate to be able to work with some incredible people setting up a, uh, the first, um, let's say, I don't want to call it a payday loan company, but the first, um, small loan micro lending company in Poland. Um, I set the thing up completely by myself as a first goer. I never did that before. And I set it up, proved the concept within two months. It was absolutely fabulous. Got $10 million backings for that to roll it out. And now it's in Lithuania, Czech Republic and Poland. I have nothing to do with it anymore, but that was really exciting because it was new. And this is how I choose my new businesses. One is intuition. Two is have I done it before. And three, if it's really difficult, I have to do it. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. That's a, a, always looking for a challenge. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's like this. If I'm going to spend time working and fighting, I'm going to do it at the same intensity that I do, whether I'm typing a letter or I'm building a new company. So I'd rather build a new company and use that intensity and do something really challenging it's because the intensity will be the same for me. I know that you were part of a, a product that pretty much went viral over Facebook. And I actually listened in on one of your talks. Uh, I think it was at an aff- might have been an affiliate <clears throat> conference in, in Europe. And you, and you talked about your experience with that startup. And I think what you just said um, sums up that they called you up and asked you if you could help. And you're like, sure. And then it's like, I've never done it before, but sure, I can do that. Could you tell us a little bit about that? That's exactly what happened. They said, um, we, you know, you're an American. We want to sell this in America. <laughs> so for them, that was enough. <laughs> and I, I never did it before. Uh, but it, like I said, um, you know, it has to do with people. All I know is I need to connect with some people in the States that sell to the big, big box retailers. And that's what I did. And within two months, we had our first order for half a million mm, uh, for Costco Canada. And then uh, we moved on to Walmart, Target and everything else. And uh, online, we sold, I think, half a million in three months, half a million units in three months. And then I moved another half a million within two months. So we we're at a million within three months. And that, of course, relates to a lot of money. Uh, coming in for the company. And this was a company that was at the dining room table in their apartment. There was four people. And suddenly we were challenged with uh, customer service issues, shipping. And because we sold so many so quick, we had to air freight everything over, which killed our margins because you're paying $50,000 to air freight bags over to America. Um, so it made a huge, a lot of huge mistakes because we were moving so quick. Um, but we did make a lot of money. So anyway, um, could have made a lot more, probably double. Um, but it was a great learning curve. And now I still work with this company and we launch new products all the time. We had another following up. Uh, we had another product after that that came out. It did a million in the first week, um, revenue. And then we had another product come out like that. It's still booming right now. Uh, most of these products you can find on amazon.com. I won't do any, any, uh, any promotion for them, but, um, you know, amazon.com or in target, uh, or Walmart, you'll see some of the products that we sell. And this is literally manufactured, sourced and sold by me. <laughs> A one-man show, and I do this on the side. So this is basically, I don't know, three days a week, three hours, four hours a day. Could uh, without going, I mean, without saying the name, I know that some of the marketing that you used was pretty innovative. Could you talk about a little bit about the the marketing you were doing for the product? Sure. When I showed up, they were making videos. Um, they were having a professional video team fly around all over they went to Mon- mongolia and they went to south africa and they went to you know spain and england and they were doing these high-end videos for 20 30 000 a pop and they're beautiful 
but they're you know two minutes long and they they weren't ads material so i pulled out my iphone and we started doing crazy stuff and we'd film it with the iphone pop it online edit it put some titles on it pop it online within 15 minutes and be selling after 30 minutes instead of the two-month wait so um yeah we ended up using almost all intuitional uh, marketing and we did targeted ads for certain companies uh, when we wanted to sell to them we made sure that we had that they saw our product um, what happens is in the end, we did it backwards. So everyone usually goes to a retailer and they try to sell to them to try to get to big deals. We said, no, let's make sure they want to buy. They have to buy from us. They have to see us. So we started booming it out on social media. And once they saw us, they gave us a call. So that's sort of how we floated, it, you know, burned a candle at both ends in order to get it going. And it worked fa- fabulously. Now all those contacts are intact and they're always asking, what do you got? What do you got? So we're always looking for the next newest, hottest product that we can turn on to these guys. How do you keep up with, you are usually hit several countries each month as you're traveling. How do, how do you deal with the cross, cross cultural, um, issues as you do that? I thrive on cross cultural issues. That's my strength. I absolutely love absorbing what the others from other, like for instance, I'm going to Cairo next month to speak. I'm there for five days. Um, and apparently I'm going to do some workshops too. I just found out. So that's even, even better. And, I find that if you're not the, let's say, the brash American, I, I don't want to use that term in the wrong way, but you know what I mean, uh, you know, so if it was like, you know, going in there, owning the place, which is hard for us soldiers not to do, <laughs> but I've learned how not to do it. If you walk in there and you're humble and you have something to offer that they otherwise wouldn't get, believe me, you are, you, you are welcomed with open arms with so much humility. I, I just can't, I can't even, I can't even express it enough. But when it comes to Germany, I'm pretty much, you know, a German now I can deal with that. Hungarians still working on that very, very difficult uh, uh, language to learn, but I'm pretty close to it. Um, I can get along just about with anybody in any country because I travel all the time and I see it as everything that I do is a, is a challenge is also a benefit for me. And it's a benefit for my, my whole life. It's sort of like, I, I, I like to say, um, I have a garden that I nurture in my garden, in my, in the garden that I nurture, I, you know, I have three plants that are really my basic plants and that's honesty, integrity, and transparency, which we spoke about. And my garden's always open to others and I like to bring my garden with me. So people come in, they meet me, they partake in my garden. My garden is, is open for everyone and it's filled with love and understanding. So this is how I approach people. So I'm giving you the fruit of my, my harvest. My harvest is my knowledge and my wisdom. So I, I let you come into my garden and you tell you partake in the knowledge and wisdom and we share and we learn from each other. And this is how I, I, I work on, let's say, cross-cultural and communi- communi- uh, communication issues with people because that's easy for anyone to understand when you sort of use that kind of attitude towards them. Come on in. Join me. Come on. Let's, let's you know, you can partake of, of what I have and let's see what you got. So it's never, hey, sit down. I'm going to tell you how to do this. It's always, it's always a, a reciprocal. Well, you're, you're a big believer and in, in you're a, a practitioner uh, extraordinary of, of just networking in general. How important is networking to your business? Well, I, I don't like to call it networking because that, that implies that I'm going out specifically to network, which I never do. For me, you're, it's just like being a leader. It's a conscious decision to be a leader 24 seven. You're not, you don't have off time. You don't have weekends off and there's nothing in between have an integrity and not have an integrity. There's no, there's, there's no like, oh, there's Steve. He has a little bit of integrity. He's okay. Either you have it or you don't. So either you're a leader, consciously decide, or you don't. Um, and that's much of the same, the same attitude that I use with that as well. So I don't, you know, I don't differentiate from that. I don't say, well, I'm going to go out specifically and network. I network all the time because I have this will and this, this, this say lust or this urge to meet as many people as possible because I love meeting people. I love having the experiences. And for me, it's never work. It's never work. I absolutely love see like all, all literally my grandfather told me something sometime and one time and it was, it was to this day. It's so true. He said, you know, and this is back in 1985 or 84. And he said, you know, everyone is negative. Honesty means negativity nowadays. And, and, and all you hear is negativity. When someone sees something about you, they don't like you. They're going to tell you. When's the last time someone said something nice to you because they saw something nice? He said, never. So. You have to promise me, he said. <laughs> you have to promise me from now on, every time you see something, no matter if you know the person or not, that's positive, just tell them. And I literally do that all the time. I'll walk to a woman or a guy 
randomly at the airport or at a bar or something, say, hey, he's like a really awesome guy, looks totally sympathetic, or sympathetic, I don't know what the word is in English, actually. Um, sympathetic, I guess you could say, you look very, like, like a very nice person, what do you do? You know, whatever, just, I like your hair or your glasses, really cool, I collect glasses or whatever. I, I always make sure whatever I say, it's real, and it came from my intuition. Because if I looked at them and I thought they were sympathetic and they thought they would look like a nice person, I'll tell them. Or that something's nice, a nice car. Like I see this gangster in this like Audi A8 with big exhaust pipes. And I said, you know, awesome car. And he goes, what'd you say? And I said, awesome car. And he didn't know how to act, <laughs> but he smiled, you know, he smiled. And, that, and that's what I do. And I don't do it to impress anybody. I do it because no one else does. And if I'm going to live this life, I'm going to, I'm going to spread as much joy and happiness as possible around me so that I can also benefit from it. You know, no one wants to live in a, in a, in a negative world. And believe me, I mean, you know, there's, there's enough negativity out there to go around. We don't need to partake in it. Well, I think one of the key things that we experience in the military and when we form our our strongest bonds and, and, and our friendships are when we're in situations that are very austere, very challenging, um, but are all removed from what we're used to. You know, we have, we, we, we're out of our normal environment. We come to an austere environment. And one of the, the talks as I was listening, you mentioned the fact that some of the best business contacts that you made were while you were working, um, at a gym or at a club and people <laughs> were outside there. Could you, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, most certainly. And that's exactly right. You know, when I first started in, in Germany, I got into the disco and nightlife. Um, you know, nightclub business, cocktail bars and restaurants. And when I started there, I realized on the bar, you had people from every walk of life. You had people from every income uh, income level. And you had um, officials, politicians, police officers, embassies, ambassadors. But they were in my living room. So they were not in their comfort zone. So they weren't the guy behind the office giving visas. They weren't the police officer that was out there arresting you. They were on my watch, so to say. So they were open to whatever I had to say, especially as a bartender and a bar owner or a club owner, or a disco owner, or whatever. So I got to meet all these people in my, in my world. So then I moved on to health clubs at the same time, actually I opened the health clubs at the same time I had the bars and, and clubs. And the same thing, you're sitting in the sauna and this guy walks in, it's the mayor of Berlin, you know, and he's not the mayor of Berlin in, in the sauna. He's some sweaty guy sitting in the sauna. <laughs> so, you know, there's no barriers there. There's no, there's no, you know, I have my office and my bodyguards here with me. No, it's just you and me in the sauna. And we're just chatting away. So that's how I made a lot of contacts. People realized, oh, you know, this guy's, this guy's, you know, personable and he's just open and he's easy and he doesn't really care who I am. He's just talking to me like he would talk to everyone else. And yeah, I've, I've to the highest levels, I have contacts like that and all over the world because we had 87 health clubs in nine countries and I was uh, yeah, responsible for those. So I, partook in the activities as much as I could to stay in shape. And that just led to more context. <laughs> Outstanding. Yeah. So one of the biggest things I try to do during the interviews is to make sure that the listeners can take away, you know, a golden nugget. Um, mm -hmm. If you were meeting with, with your, your, your background and your, again, your eclectic experience across several different verticals. Now, if you would, Talk to a person who's getting set to start a business. What would be the things that you would tell that person right now? Well, you know, you have the standard, you know, what's, where, where are you going? What do you, you know, what do you want to do to get there? Why are you going there? How much do you want? You know, just the typical questions. But for me, um, more importantly is, are you going to have enjoyment doing what you're doing? Or are you just doing it for the money? Because if you're just doing it for the money, it's going to be short term. And for me, it's all about finding the joy and something that is less of an effort but more of a joy. So finding that is really, really difficult, but it comes through learning how to use your intuition. So when you slowly look at something and say, I would love to do that, but I don't know how we have this amazing, you know, Google or Yahoo or whatever, where you can learn anything on any, on any, any book or anywhere you want teach yourself quickly before you jump in to earn that, you know, five, 50,000 a year, wait a couple more weeks or maybe a month or two and make it a hundred thousand a year. By choosing the right business for you, what do you want to do? What makes you joy? What, you know, what makes you happy? What can you do for you? You know, what I always say people look for the product. They look for the job. Look, for, look at yourself first. What are you worth? What can you teach others? You know, and nowadays everybody's a coach. Why? Because everyone has a unique ability that they've honed over the years. And that's this wisdom I was talking about. That's money. <laughs> Even if you start that on the side, you start coaching. For instance, you have a guy who makes, makes, um, um, fake rocks, I don't know what they're called, you know, fake rocks for zoos or whatever. 
you can coach somebody how to do that. You got someone who's a, I don't know, a cook, coach somebody how to cook. And you do, if you have one client a week and they pay you 50 bucks a week, that's 200 bucks a month. Just something like that to get started and say, well, I can maybe grow that. That's how I started coaching. I didn't, I didn't say I'm a coach, you know, I just started coaching when I was a corporate manager. And then someone asked me outside of that, Hey, could you help me out? I did. And it just grew from there. So I didn't stop what I was doing, start a new business and it was successful. I did all these things at once. Now, a point to that is, is I like to make, and it's very important, is that <clears throat> I have probably five businesses that I'm either consulting or owning or running. And the only way I can do that is because I have partners and, and people who work with me, they're all self-employed, um, that I can trust. And that means that I can delegate the task 100% to them and only check in on them to see how it's going with a structure in place to when they report. But I never delegate the responsibility. So it's always within my you know, my agenda to keep, to make sure it's running right. And that's how I can be free myself up to be creative and grow my business. Otherwise I'm stuck in the trenches like everybody else. Now, don't get me wrong. I'll go to the trenches like I am right now with this company um, and making it happen. Uh, if you have to, you have to, and there's no problem with that. But for me, it's all about empowering the others to let them grow into a business leader in your own organization and possibly take it over or buy you out or whatever. And then being my, being freeing myself up to be flexible, creative and grow my other businesses. So important. Well, you mentioned about the coaching side of the house and uh, I agree a hundred percent. And But many people hesitate to do that. Two main reasons. I believe it's, I think it's self doubt and overwhelm. Um, would you agree with that? Completely. Self doubt is number one for sure. They go, well, what, what if you know, I had it too. When, when, when I got hired as a corporate manager the first time, I, I got out of the army. I was 28 or 29, opened my bars and clubs. And then when I was 32, I got hired as a corporate manager making a lot of money. And suddenly I was a, a, a stock owner in this, in this British PLC, uh, publicly, listed, publicly listed company. And I had the stock options and I was making all this money. And I was like, when are they going to figure out who I am? I'm not this guy they think I am. You know, so I had no, so I had self doubt like crazy, but I said, you know what? They gave me the chance. I'm not going to let them down. So that's how I learned to get over it. Now, other people learn to get over it by getting a coach, just grab a coach. It can be anybody, you know, everybody knows uh, something about something. And for me, that self doubt, I, I like to use, um, well, I went to the monastery to help that as well. Plus other things I use mantras, uh, and I make sure that I be good to myself, um, as much as I possibly can and make sure that I'm consciously aware of what I'm thinking about me. Um, there's where we are our worst enemy. We might mean we push ourselves down. We scold ourselves. We beat ourselves up when we screw up. We're our biggest critic. You know, that that's got to stop. That's got to stop. That doesn't help anyone, least of all you. So when it comes to coaching to say, look, you know, start with, if, if you feel like, you know, um, someone's going to, um, someone needs some coaching or someone's you want to coach somebody, try to work with somebody that you know needs what you have to start that way, you know, um, and just start, start that way or, or, or a relative or something and see how it goes. Uh, I think when, one of the things when I talk to the people that are interested in coaching is that at the end of the day, if they can simply help someone reach an end state that they want to reach faster than they could do by themselves, you're providing value and you should feel confident and good about providing that value. That to me, that's, that's one of the key things. And yeah. Then perfect. On the, the sense of over, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. You, you, no, I said you put it better than I could have. Exactly. And then, but when it comes to overwhelm and, and this is something I took from the military um, is that talk, people talk about, living with intention and intentional living or how to deal with overwhelm. One of the things I took away from the military as a leader in the military was the one third, two thirds rule that anytime mm -hmm. you're given a task, you use one third for yourself for planning and whoever's executing, whether it's yourself or, or somebody else that you're working with, you always give them two thirds of the time. So they have the preponderance of the time and you just take that one third. Mm -hmm. Do you, what, what's your technique for dealing with like overwhelm when you have a task? Well, <clears throat> well, any task I take on, the first thing I do is, is structure it. So I'll structure what needs to get done, when it needs to get done, how it needs to get done, and who can possibly do it. Then, then I find the right people. I have, I have a, a real simple system. It's called PPS, People, Procedures, and Structures. So I basically, I'll structure it up, put the procedures in place, and find the right people. 
Um, and <clears throat> that's how I start out. So yeah, I, I, I try to delegate as much as possible. So I, like I said, so I can stay free, but I don't give away, um, the responsibility nor the brunt of the, of the, the beginning task. In the beginning, I like to set it, set it up and structure it and stuff and make sure the procedures are in place and understand the procedures and that they're behind them themselves and that they're also co, co creators of these procedures so that they're, they, they can therefore develop ownership. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much how I do it. So basically what you said, just, um, um, basics, very, very basic, <laughs> very big, basically structure. What are the procedures for that structure and who are the best people for that, for those procedures? I've really enjoyed talking with you today, Stephen. Uh, before we go with everything we've covered, is there anything that we haven't talked about yet that you'd leave, want to leave with our listening audience? Well, Jack, thank you. First of all, it's, it's pretty uh, exciting and humbling to be on a, on a talk show. I, I just, uh, I li- what I like to say is that, you know, as I said, everything's connected to people and everything we do is connected to people, whether it's our, our private life or our business life. And, you know, there's nothing more important than you. You know, no one else is you. No one else can be you and no one else will be you as good as you. So there's nothing like embracing that being embracing it with inspiration and motivation. And of course, in the end, being authentic. The authenticity is what brings us to the next level. I think that's so important. And also, I think goes back to helping people with their self doubt is that there's people that are entering a market and feel they have something to say possibly. But they become uncertain because there's already people in that market and there are already people saying it. And I think what you brought out about everyone has their own voice. And some people aren't going to relate to those other people's voices, but they'll relate to yours. Um, is that what you found to be true in, in your experience? Most certainly. I, I, you know, I've, I've, I have the talent now. It's, it's been a long time. I, I wrote a book uh, in Germany in 2003. It became a bestseller. And so I was fortunate enough to be on a book tour for a year and I did TV probably three times a day and I probably did, I don't know, 300 TV stations, uh, 300 TV shows. And then of course, uh, live readings every day. So I got to practice that and I figured out how to use tonality in order to reach the people, how to feed off of their energy as far as what they want to hear. So a lot of my keynote speeches are tailored. They have a basic structure, but they're tailored to the energy in the room, the people's feedback and sort of their, 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 their facial expressions and things. So I've learned how to, um, fit my, let's say my voice and that what I will have to say to what those, uh, uh the, the listeners are hearing. Now remember, people stay interested through one interaction and two through stories. So I, for any speaker or any coach out there, coaches, first of all, all they do is ask questions. Coaches ask questions and get the information out of you that's already in you that you didn't know was in you. That's a coach. And then you have uh, speakers and speakers basically keep you entertained while giving you information. If you're just giving information and you're not keeping them entertained with stories and, you know, in you know, in and all kinds of little, little, little things, then they're going to get bored and it'll be dry and no one's going to want to come to your, your keynote speeches or your seminars. So for me, that's, that's something I like to focus on as well. It's all about people again. So we boil back down to that. Well, thanks again, Stephen. I know you took time out of your busy schedule to, to, to share some of your experience, some of your story, and then some of your insights from, from your, varied background here and and i'm hoping i know i've taken notes while we've been talking and i'm sure that our listeners have taken some positive things away from here and things they can use in their business so thanks again for being on the show and uh, i guess we're going to wrap it up for now my absolute pleasure jack i appreciate uh, the invitation and um, i'm sure we'll be speaking soon in the uh, veteran tribe You've been listening to the Small Business Evangelist radio show with host Jack Schoenberger. To find out more about resources mentioned during the show or to let us know you're interested in being a featured guest on an upcoming episode, please visit thesmallbusinessevangelist.com.